security here at HashiCorp. Um, <clears throat> what that means is that uh, I focus on how we build and develop products like Vault and Boundary, um, and how we think about developing features for security and cryptography um, focused use cases across all the products here at the company. Um, this is pretty relevant because as we're about to talk about, zero trust, at, at least in terms of how we see it here at HashiCorp, is not a single product story. It's not a single use case. It is a comprehensive treatment that we need to think about in terms of how we deliver zero trust across a number of products and ultimately how we satisfy sort of the challenges related to this, this, this new and exciting area of information security. Um, just a little bit about uh, us as a company. Uh, we've been around since 2012, and we were originally founded as a consequence of our two co-founders, Mitchell and Armand, seeing a unique opportunity in their experiences uh, doing research at the University of Washington on infrastructure, um, namely about you know looking at the evolution of uh, software infrastructure in the face of a major destabilizing element, which is the cloud. Um, you know, and not just like a like the single movement to the cloud, but rather the sort of um, abstract movement to a world where you manage less of your own infrastructure and you manage less of your own infrastructure across a number of different infrastructure platforms. Um, so we call that now multi-cloud, but really it was about, you know, what happens when what the world starts to become less static in sort of who controls what data and where that data lives uh, and more towards a dynamic world where developers um, may not control all of data, but they, or the data path or sort of what infrastructure choices are made, but they heavily influence it such that um, there needs to be significant changes in how we sort of provision, secure, connect, and run that infrastructure and applications that run on that infrastructure. Um, since 2012, we've grown to over a thousand employees. We've taken on around 350 million in funding um, from a, a host of Silicon Valley um, and uh, the New York-based VCs. Um, and we've built a product portfolio that really focuses on how do you provision, secure, connect, and run any kind of infrastructure for any kind of application across uh, eight products, um, all of which are open core based. Um, so we, are, we take open source here very seriously at HashiCorp. Um, we see it as not just important for the development of um, us as a company, uh, but we also see it really important as a development for the community. Um, you know, there are a number of other like premium uh, commercial products out there that use tools like Vault and Terraform as its core foundation. It's important for us to make sure that, you know, when we, when we, we talk about things like um, core utility and provisioning uh, applications, core security and using things like Vault, that we can get, you know, not even just give back, but provide a solid resource that the community can use to be able to um, ultimately satisfy the needs around what this provision secure connected run um, kind of mandate is across all of our products. Um, it's also very important, by the way, uh, because I know that this is a security focused crowd um, from a security perspective. Um, we'll talk about this in like, more detail when we go to Vault, but when we talk about Vault in particular, um, you know, security uh, is, you know, open source is a really elemental part of our security story as well. We don't want to hide behind um, some kind of obscurity around how we develop and deploy things like cryptographic keys or other elements of Vault security. We heavily subscribe to this uh, principle called the Kirchhoff's principle, which states that there is effectively no security and obscurity. So it's really important for us to, you know, use open source uh, and not just as a, you know, a means to develop functionality within our products, but also as like a strategic means for us to engender better utility and better security, both within the product as well as within the community as a whole. So, uh, you know, the evolution of our, uh, you know, our commercial pro uh, partners has been, um, you know, significant over the course of the last uh, five to six years. Um, I joined uh, HashiCorp in 2016. And since then, I mean, we've grown to over a thousand enterprise uh, those commercial partners, a significant portion of the Fortune 10 and the Fortune 500 use our products. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because as much as we would love to, you know, take credit for it, a lot of this is a combination of the community as well as sort of Mitchell and Armand, our two co-founders being absolutely right. Um, when we move from this statically defined world to a dynamic world, this provision secure connect and run uh, challenge is one that's spread across, you know, a, a wide swath of industries, a wide swath of use cases. I mean, these are challenges that everyone faces in, you know, how they move to the cloud, to multi-cloud, across containers for a number of different places. And this, security is actually a very significant challenge. So um, we've been excited to uh, see that, you know, our efforts have been uh, valued by our commercial partners. And we 
you know, we really take that seriously. When we talk about um, a phrase that we use a lot here, which is that, um, you know, we see our relationships with our customers as a partnership. Um, we're helping them to navigate um, a number of very significant seismic challenges and in the security domain, um, frequently elemental challenges to their success. So why does Vault exist as well as like our focus on security? Provision Secure Connect and Run is kind of an interesting set of, um, you know, areas for us to tackle. That's basically all of infrastructure, right? Well, in the security side, uh, this has been a fairly challenging world as many of you probably already know. Um, you know, we're it's estimated that there's approximately 6 trillion in um, economic losses according uh, in this upcoming year, which is sort of par for the course um, over the last 10 years. The last 10 years, um, losses due to information security uh, related events have been very, very significant. Um, in some cases, like, you know, potentially acts of war uh, for large countries. Um, you know, the number of data breaches, we actually tracked these metrics when we were first developing Vault. And it was really interesting when Vault Enterprise first came out, there was a, a kind of startling trend where, uh, you know, for the for what would be considered large data breaches, um, you know, 90% of those uh, companies that deployed, uh, you know, or, or, or suffered underneath them immediately started using Vault within like the roughly 18 months afterwards. And that was a, a pretty big wake up call to us. Um, and I think as well as the industry that something really needs to be done. And, you know, as many of you have already seen, um, you know, a great example of how this trend is not changing and it's probably getting worse, to be honest with you, is the most recent attacks with UNC 2452. So for those of you that are unaware of this term, this is SolarWinds attack. Um, so SolarGate or UNC 2452 showed a kind of striking, uh, striking new evolution um, in how we look at supply chain attacks um, over the course of the last uh five to 10 years. Supply chain attacks are nothing new. Um, these are attacks that have occurred well beyond the 2010s, even in the 2000s. Um, you know, why not, for example, attack sort of the, the sanctum sanctorum of how uh, someone developed software to be able to leverage attacks. What's changed a lot is that um, the complexity associated with how adversaries leapfrog through um, uh, infrastructure has changed, um, as well as just like the static dynamics. Sometimes that infrastructure is on places where you know, the defender does not necessarily have full control over their environment. Um, the consequences of this is that you know, there's a, an age old story of stealing credentials to be able to leverage you know, and purchase further attack on other infrastructure. Um, again, this happened, but it happened in a, a more serious, I wouldn't even say serious way, um, in some cases a more striking way uh, with what infrastructure was uh, compromised, namely Office 365, as well as perhaps even more frighteningly uh, Mimecast. Um, and attacking CA infrastructure. Um, you know, it's what's kind of scary about attacks like this is that I feel like 10 or 15 years ago, and, and I come from originally a security research background. Um, you know, if you if you look back in like the early 2010s, we could usually say like, you know, that's all right. You know, something like, well, it's all right, but it's, you know, you can see 2452 and other types of like very complex state-sponsored cyber attacks. Um, you know, that's, that's a very high profile, like, you know, um, well-resourced adversary that isn't going to be um, you know, something that could be leveraged against um, like me for quote unquote um, immediately. And the reality is that's not true. Um, unfortunately today with the advances in attack automation, I mean, like there are, for example, definitions out for a lot of this stuff for pretty much every SIM, as well as from a research perspective, um, you know, there's, there are, for example, the means to be able to uh, deploy this using stuff like um, Metasploit and other kinds of like modern attack tools. Um, and that's important from a research perspective, but it also highlights the fact that like the, even though you have large state sponsored cyber attacks continuing to be a little bit higher grade than most attacks, unless you were in a vertical that might, or otherwise an in industry or, or, or specifically a type of uh, use case that you're operating on that might be subject to them. Um, you're not necessarily safe anymore, but just because um, from an attack automation perspective, it's really easy to, once these kind of go into the mainstream to build automation that could then be used by uh, attack tools. So, um, you know, the, 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 the loop, or at least the distance between advanced attacks like um, UNC 2452 and what we would consider to be normal sort of like adversaries uh, that are not espionage or state sponsor based, it's not that far. It only takes a short amount of time before suddenly everyone can wield attacks like these. And what this highlights is that, you know, 
people are going to go after credentials. People are going to go after means to compromise other points of infrastructure so that they can infiltrate in, um, you know, other types of mechanisms, other types of malware, et cetera, um, to do very, very bad things. Um, so we got to think about that for a little bit. We have to step back as an industry and ask ourselves, okay, what can we do to better resolve ourselves against these kind of like credential targeting attacks, um, especially if they mean that, um, you know, a, adversaries are able to break into our sanctum sanctorum how do we deal with a world where this like what we would consider to be statically defined safe infrastructure may not be as safe as we thought and attackers are truly behind the wire well actually this is interesting because this is sort of the world that we've been talking about for a while you know this is another destabilizing event what we consider to be conventional infrastructure so to step back for a moment um when we talk about that movement from static to dynamic that created the company um well, this is what we were talking about. Uh, we were talking about this world for like purely controlled, dedicated infrastructure, which could be like hybrid cloud, it could be purely on-prem, whatever, transition into a world of what we would consider modern infrastructure, the modern data center. And this is a combination of, uh, you know, still dedicated infrastructure. There's still going to be a world where that kind of like, you know, personally managed stack infrastructure is necessary, but also engagements with different types of like uh, cloud providers, different types of container platforms, et cetera, are going to happen. And they may happen sporadically, or even as we look towards like the end of this decade and the next, and the next one, ephemerally. Um, and there needs to be participation between systems of engagement where I have application developers building applications on these different types of platforms or infrastructures, um, engaging with what we consider to be that like statically defined rigorously controlled infrastructure um, that, would be, that would be the system of record. And again, as we look back to the, some of these other attacks, this doesn't necessarily need to be about the cloud. This could be about things like, for example, statically defined, rigidly controlled, safe infrastructure. Um, what happens in a world where that's not necessarily as safe as we thought? I mean, it's the same kind of problem. There's We are moving from a world where we understand a lot of how things work to I don't necessarily know where all my data is going or what I'm interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, what happens then when we talk about that movement from the cloud uh, or rather migration to the cloud in the context of static dynamic? Well, in a traditional data center or in like a traditional static control infrastructure, a lot of this really isn't necessarily more safe, quote unquote, it's just more known. Um, you know, statically defined networks and firewalls mean that I know roughly where the perimeter sits. Uh, within that perimeter, I know roughly what everything is because it has an IP that I can at least register and understand. Um, you know, I think that when I think about it, like cryptographic security, protecting keys and credentials here, I can deploy HSMs, kind of infrastructure, I know where they are. Um, I can deploy SIM software that's able to register roughly ev what everything is, what their interactions are supposed to look like. And if I want to look at it from like an IDS or IPS perspective, it might be a lot easier to be able to determine what's aberrant behavior versus non-aberrant behavior. And I can actually implement physical access restrictions. If we're talking on-prem, I can lock the data center. I can station a guard in front of the front door. Uh, that is not necessarily possible in a world where we look towards that model of dynamic infrastructure. Um, you know, with dynamic access and dynamic networking, I might have users like connect who have to, for legitimate reasons, spawning ephemeral connections outside of that like sanctum sanctorum to different types of external like uh, uh, platforms of service or infrastructure that is, uh, you know, otherwise interacting or being spawned in a way where I don't necessarily know where or what it is. Um, we move away from this world of like IP defined or strictly defined identity within one context to a world where there's multiple different types of identities. And if any of you here are work, working on a multi-cloud today, you probably feel this firsthand where you're thinking, okay, I want to go operate on the same workflow in AWS that I do in, uh, in Azure. Problem, um, the identity that I have to use on AWS has no sort of linkage or understanding to what my identity is in Azure Active Directory. So if I want to commute a workload from one to the other, suddenly now I have to figure out a way to span access control, to span sort of like the visibility of what this application is and verifying it is who it says it is to another infrastructure, to a world where maybe ACLs are different. Um, you know, the identity and access from that other infrastructure isn't, you know, uh, identifiable or otherwise uh, locked in at all, et cetera. And then finally, you know, access control is very software defined, which means that sometimes ACLs or like uh, other types of privileges that uh, I might need to use role-based access control, it's gonna change a lot. Um, especially when we're thinking about like different types of identity infrastructures that have different ways of assigning privilege and access. So in that model, things get very complicated really quickly. And especially where we look to where we are today, right? You know, I think that, you know, especially for uh, like medium sized to large size enterprises, um, it's, you know, there may be parts of your infrastructure that are kind of moving towards dynamic infrastructure, but there's still a lot of static infrastructure there. The linkage between the two gets very, very complicated very quickly. And it gets very challenging to be able to 
leverage that in a way that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, require the strict management of static credentials. And as we saw in SolarWinds and SolariGate, um, that's a problem because again, if I have to like hold onto a credential so I can like have an application walk over to another piece of infrastructure and that credential is like long lived in any way, shape or form, that makes it much harder for me to adapt to a, a situation where there might've been a breach or there might've been um, an adversary gaining purchase in my infrastructure and leveraging knowledge of that statically defined credential to do very bad things. So this is a challenge regardless of whatever your use case is, connect, provision, secure, run, but it's a very con serious consideration when it comes to security just because now statically defined long-lived credentials, which might be necessary to bridge that gap from static to dynamic, um, could otherwise be used against you. So the result of this is that we as a company from the secure side see our goal as building zero trust infrastructure. And what we define as zero trust is what we would say is this, we trust nothing, unauthenticate, and authorize everything. Um, definitely recognize that zero trust though is kind of a, a pretty vogue and like a uh, security term. There's a lot of ways to think about sort of what zero trust is. So let me contextualize this in the way that we actually contextualize this for our board when we first built Boundary. Um, our goal is to live in what I like to call a city of doors. So city of doors is this concept that imagine that you're walking down a street and this street is just a empty street with a bunch of doors. Um, we would love to live in a world of zero trust where uh, the most important thing that you have is the keychain in your pocket. And what this keychain is, it's a means of identifying and attesting that you are who say you are. Now, we don't care necessarily what the keychain itself is. We don't care how what your key looks like. We just care that there's a means to verify that you are who you say you are. Um, you walk up to a door uh, that you would like to go into for a house. You insert your key into that, click the handle, and suddenly the house assembles around you, sort of like you walk into a building being built around you and has everything that you need necessary to be able to uh, resolve any challenges that you might need. Um, you know, you could sleep there, cook food, or like relax, et cetera. But then when you're done, you leave the house, close the door and the house disappears around you. Um, and there's, once again, you're just left with a bunch of doors on an empty street. Now, if we looked at infrastructure in the same way, what this would mean is that this brings us to a world of really powerful ephemeral zero trust infrastructure. It's zero trust in the sense that that house doesn't live there for a statically defined long period of time. You can destroy it. Um, it doesn't need to exist. I could always just go to another house, for example, insert my key and I could build another house around me for my use case. Um, it also means that there's nothing from a, a, an adversary perspective to hack into for a prolonged period of time. Um, you know, you basically need to hit the house to go rob the house when I'm inside it. And when I'm done, there's nothing there to rob. Um, that's really good from a perfect forward security perspective because, um, well, it's, it's really, I basically have to record all my actions and even then that gets really challenging thanks to good cryptography. Um, but beyond that, there's just nothing to break into, right? There's nothing to go, there's no window to smash. There's nothing to like sneak into the house in. It's just an empty street. And so this further complicates the ability for adversaries to be able to steal things. And as we saw in sort of the solar winds model of like, you know, I might have statically defined credentials to statically defined infrastructure. If I don't have statically defined, you know, either of them, if it's just basically me, my key ring and a street of empty doors, this makes it really, really, really hard to be an adversary in this world. And this is what we define as zero trust. This is the world that we want to go into where I have to authorize uh, everything, which means that I have to go up to the door and insert my key. And ideally there's nothing in that infrastructure that could be like statically attacked for a prolonged period of time, thus ensuring that it's easier for an adversary to be able to, to gain purchase in that infrastructure. The houses aren't connected to each other necessarily even. And you get to define sort of what's in the house. Um, basically, it, sh it makes the job for an adversary much harder. And this is what we're trying to do. This isn't something that you can do in just one product here at HashiCorp. This is a comprehensive story of, um, you know, uh, across a multiple series of products. We're going to talk about what that is. But I just want to contextualize this into sort of this is what we talk about when we talk about zero trust here. We want to live in a city of doors. So tactically, what this means is that we live in the city of doors is really about identity driven controls or what we call identity based security. And this means that we assume that you already have a means of authentication and authorization for ultimately what your identity systems are, right? You get to choose how, depending upon your application of a structure or your user of a structure, what are the right ways to authorize access into your world, but we need to give you know, means for frameworks to allow you to be able to link them all together, regardless of wherever your infrastructure is, to assemble a house. So the first case here is really about the machines, machine-based authentication and authorization. 
This is where Vault comes into play. So for those of you that are unaware, um, HashiCorp Vault is uh, our first security product that we released back in 2015 with our uh, initial enterprise product being released in 2016. And what Vault is, is Vault is really just a, um, a means for handling what we would consider to be the biggest challenge in security, which is how, like, you know, removing the complexity associated with protecting secrets and identifying users or applications regardless of whatever their infrastructure is and whatever is the means to authenticate them. Uh, this takes the case in two forms. So, um, you know, regardless of whether you're a, a human or machine-based application or a client, um, first authenticating that you are who you say you are. So this goes back to the whole challenge we we're talking about before with like the dynamic world means there's a lot of different types of like means for authentication. Vault has what we call off methods that allow you to be able to um, link um, different means or certificates of authentication with sort of the workflow or logical identity of what that user is. And a great example of this, it's not technical, is sort of your like your wallet. In my wallet, I have a driver's license, a library card, uh, you know, credit cards, debit cards, et cetera. Um, now, these all are a little bit different in the workflow that they're all supposed to be used for, but they're all means of verifying that I am who I say I am, right? Like you could see my credit card and have my name on it and say, oh, well, it's probably Andy Minoski's. And especially if he's still like got his driver's license and his library card there too, it's a pretty good likelihood that this person is who they say they are. Um, so it's the same thing with like certificates of identity or means of attestation, like, you know, whether we're talking about a, a GCP IAM role, AWS IAM role, Azure um, Active Directory credential, you know, X509 certificate, et cetera. You could have multiple ways of verifying, a, a, you know, a user that are different types of credentials, but are the same sort of logical identity of who they are. And maybe they mean different things in different contexts, but they still identify the same user. This is a big part of Vault. This is what we would call the uh, unified identity system that involves. And through a combination of that unified identity system for a distinct different types of entities to a log or a different types of aliases to a logical entities via that authentication method, users are able to, um, uh, or rather organizations are able to orchestrate access in a really powerful way that could change. For example, I could have different auth methods like spin up or spin down as I add new ways of attesting users. I just don't have to reinvent the wheel associated with what their access control rights are or what they should or should not be able to do. Um, once I have an authentication method that's been verified, I have the means to be able to provide secrets for uh, those users. So I could, and this is an interesting thing here. I think traditionally, um, when we think about um, secrets and secrets management, it was a very like you know statically defined to what the actual workflow is, right? Like I couldn't have a general purpose secret. I had to have like a cryptographic key or a credential or you know something else or a password. Vault doesn't care what that secret is as long as it can be encoded in a 32-bit string. We can protect it, and we can protect it in a way where you don't need to think about its cryptography at all. But Vault can automate the protection of that security at both at rest and in flight with very, very strong cryptography. Um, and what's even better about this is, uh, you know, it's not just holding the secret or protecting it. Not Vault isn't just like a, a secure database. What it can also do is that it also can orchestrate access for you or orchestrate what you were trying to do. Um, so we see this a lot with credential management, where um, users or applications um, want to be able to, let's say, um, you know, do something on the AWS API. If they want to be able to spin up an EC2 instance programmatically. They could pull out the secret key from AWS uh, for Vault or from within Vault, or what they could do is they could say, hey, Vault, I'm trying to go do this thing. Can you give me like a means to be able to perform this API interaction? And Vault will say, sure. It will go out and dynamically generate a new IAM role from that AWS secret key so that if you, even if an adversary steals that credential, it's a very short-lived credential, doesn't give them additional purchasing infrastructure, et cetera. So that's really, really, really powerful. Um, it's one of the reasons why Vault has been so successful is the means for Vault to orchestrate security operations. And that's because um, you know, it moves to this world or where we're living in a more dynamic environment where there's lots of things going on, lots of credentials being thrown around, but the credentials are all extremely short-lived, whether it's like a credential for logging to a cloud interface, whether it is a certificate, Vault can serve as a CA uh, that is short-lived uh, and just constantly rotating, et cetera. We move the onus away from how do I have application developers have to you know, protect credentials with their lives to a world of how do the applications just go in and re-authenticate themselves over and over again to get new credentials in an automated fashion. And that's much safer than the world where we have to have application developers like think rigorously about security for protecting all of their credentials. So um, yeah, since the uh, release of Vault um, over the last five years, Vault and Vault Enterprise have uh, gained a significant amount of traction. Um, you know, we see uh, you know organizations like, for example, Adobe, um, who have 
been using Vault Enterprise for a long time, processing over two trillion transactions on it per year. There are the major stock exchanges, um, commodities exchanges that trust their entire trading infrastructure and authentication infrastructure to Vault. Um, and today we have roughly around 500 enterprise customers, well, actually a little bit more than that, uh, plus enterprise customers that focus on and trust Vault with really you know, mission critical information. Um, not just from protecting their secrets or you know managing key life cycles, but really hardening how they think about you know protecting credentials and access across not just their infrastructure today, but their infrastructure tomorrow. And I think that's the interesting thing that we really like about Vault is that you know historically security has seen as sort of the enemy or at least like the inhibitor to um, to, to to progress to innovation. But with Vault, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time that you want to be able to like adopt a new type of sensitive workflow. Um, you can be, and this really is exciting because it means that once you know how you would like an application to authenticate itself, you can focus purely all of your time on like, how do I be innovative and build solutions with that application rather than, okay, and now do I, how, how do I get like the credential from here? How do I protect it with the application, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're really excited about where we're going with Vault. Um, and I think, you know, as we look towards the future in Vault, there's a strong foundation for us to be able to, you know, accomplish a lot with the community and with our commercial partners. Um, you know, the, the adoption that we've seen over the last six years has been really exciting. And it's also one of the reasons why we started looking more at zero trust is because as we started to hear more from, you know, the, the 500 plus organizations that, that trust Vault with all their mission critical data with the, you know, the people, the open source community that, that uses, you know, Vault 2 for a lot of sensitive information, this concept of like, okay, how do I really get to what we would consider to be zero trust, the city of doors, um, to, uh, it's been something that's been coming up over and over and over again. So Vault is part of the story. It's part of the story because of uh, this identity brokering aspect that we talked about, right? How do I stretch um, and think about identity in a cohesive way across infrastructure and a means that, you know, whether we're talking about different clouds, different container environments, et cetera, um, where I don't have to force application developers to like rigorously protect their information I, I just encode a single workflow, and if I'm ever concerned about something, I just invalidate um, what those um, dynamic certificates or like dynamic credentials of the vault uh, creates. That's a big way that we've seen to challenge um, and resolve against cyber attacks, like we've seen with SolarWinds, where an adversary is stealing statically defined credentials. Um, and this is not a like theoretical thing. We have had users who use Vault Enterprise, who have been the subject of data reaches while they use Vault Enterprise. And Vault Enterprise actually was untouched. It was stood up to very resourced adversaries. And that was just because, you know, from an adversary perspective, um, you know, they their their primary focus, even for the really, really well-resourced state-sponsored adversaries, is to steal credentials typically from mismanaged applications or users that are using them. Um, it's if they have to tangle with Vault, then they're tangling with pretty powerful cryptography. Now it becomes a question of code breaking and that's just a lot of work. Um, so, you know, it's, the, you know, the there's a lot that's done when you just get better at identity brokering and allowing you the flexibility to choose how you would like to change your identity infrastructure and not reinvent the wheel or force applications to, you know, overly rigorously protect that data. Um, but that's one, just one area of the story. So we talk about like authorization and um, authentication for machines or applications in this world. What about machine to machine access, right? Like, you know, what about when we think about things at the network layer? Well, this is really where, where console comes into play. And console is our, when we talk about the secure provision connect and run, console is like the heart and soul or connect element of this. And the city of doors model console would be really the street that you're walking on. Um, you know, as I drop in new houses on the street, I still have to have a way to get to that house. Um, and in a really dynamic world, the challenges that console focuses on become very apparent. Um, so console originally began as an open source product that we use to look at like service discovery and health monitoring, but really where it evolved as we looked at like dynamic infrastructure was around um, first multi-platform service mesh. Service mesh is also a very exciting <laughs> hype term um, around like being able to have like dynamically spawning aspects of your infrastructure. Um, but I think at a more core elemental way, our, the real focus of from this perspective is really on network infrastructure and automation. How do I like accelerate application delivery and sort of the um, the operations of applications with console to be able to help ensure that those applications can be networked to the right places where they need to go in the event of like um, destabilizing changes that need to happen. Or in the case of, we talked about with Vault, like sort of like the delivery of those credentials. How do I make sure that there is a means as I deploy new application infrastructure for me to safely go grab everything that I need to be able to be operating? And this is, yeah. When we talk about the zero trust story here, the core of what we want to focus on with console is really around that application-based 
networking model. Um, you know, we can discover new services. When the service is discovered, they can be authenticated properly. Um, we can do all this in a way where there's no statically defined IP, which if you overly static focus on statically defined IP, in many ways that becomes a guiding principle of your, your identity, right? And it's like, if I am who I say I am at this position, then I should get to do whatever I want. Well, that's not true, right? Like I don't wanna further focus like, or otherwise provide purchase for an application or for an adversary to be able to align themselves to the specific like part of your network infrastructure. Um, and this is a really big problem because, you know, if you give an adversary enough time, they're gonna figure all this stuff out, right? Like Kirchhoff's principle, there is no security to obscurity. Well, if I rely on sort of like a statically defined position on my infrastructure as effectively part of my identity, given enough time that adversary is gonna come and they're gonna go, that's the ball game. So console really helps out there because it allows us to be able to live in a world where not only can I drop in new like uh, doors along that street, but that the, the doors don't have to be in a specific position or I don't have to walk in a certain way um, as part of how I go up to the door and unlock it. Um, so console is really important in that aspect of allowing us the beans to be able to you know, walk along the street to whatever door that I want. But then there's a last portion here. You know, with console and vault, um, for applications, you know, the, the, common, the combination of those two have been really elemental to building would be considered zero trust. But there's one last really big component, which is human access. Um, and this is where Boundary comes into play. Boundary is a product that we released at the end of last year. Um, it was one of the first two pro new products that we've released as a company in almost five years. Uh, and this is really about, you know, how do we handle human, and uh, how do we automate uh, human access to these systems? Basically, you know, how do I, when I insert that key as a person, as opposed to an application, um, you know, get inside the house. Um, so how Boundary works is that Boundary, similar to Vault, tries to abstract the identity-based security problem here. So a user, when they come in and authenticate, they can authenticate through a number of different means, including Vault, for example, um, but really whatever you want. You don't have to use any HashiCorp product with each other that can run independently on their own. Once they've been authorized to access, then um, we then allow them to be able to have a dynamic connection and dynamic instantiation of the environment that they're trying to get into. This is effectively the part where you build the house all around them after they've authenticated who they are. Um, and, and the result of this is that you have really ephemeral secure access through uh, boundary that really allows you to be able to access any kind of system from anywhere based on that user identity. Let's go make the problem that you have to solve an identity problem as opposed to a networking problem as opposed to a like credential management problem, et cetera. That user isn't like getting a credential and then walking in over to the house to open it. They just insert the key, click it, and the house builds around them. Um, so it, it's really exciting. Boundary is still very new, but where things go as a result is that if you do all of these things right, if you really do work hard to authorize and authenticate um, machine-based workflows, authorize and authenticate human-based workflows, dynamically link them all together in a way that I could drop in these new doors, drop in like, you know, a new user with their own keychain that they want. We can go leverage what we consider to be zero trust in any kind of infrastructure for any kind of application. And that's really important today because we totally understand we are not your only security tool. Right, you already have made major investments into security frequently, um, whether it's in HSMs, whether it's in like identity systems, et cetera. We don't want you to change that. What we would love to do is enable you to be able to live more in this world where we reduce the attack surface for your adversaries. Where the adversaries have, just like everyone else, they have to go in and authenticate over and over again that they are who they say that they are. We don't trust them with long-lived credentials. They can just walk down the street and get into. And if we do things right, if we do things right in a way that we allow you the ability to be able to simplify the process of how machines and users authenticate and gain access to a system, uh, we simplify the means to like ensure that you can create network access uh, regardless of like how long lived or short lived that you know a system that needs to be connected to your infrastructure is. You know, it, it makes things a lot easier and enables you to focus on innovation, building applications to solve challenges that you really care about, as opposed to solving security based challenges or forcing application developers suddenly to become bastions of protecting credentials within their applications um, and to use and leverage all the infrastructure that you already have today. And this is really what we consider to be zero trust. This is what we really consider to be a, a world that we would like to live in to make it really, really hard for an adversary to break into something because ultimately those credentials that they stole, the, the house they're trying to break into, they're not gonna exist in 10 seconds. And that's zero trust here at HashiCorp. 
now I know that we have a Q&A session I'd love to shift into, but we're really, um, yeah, I know that this is a really vogue series of topics here. This is kind of how we look at, you know, Zero Trust. Happy to answer any questions about anything you've seen, uh, questions about console vaults, uh, boundary, or just things about how we look at security cryptography. Really appreciate your time and thank you. Thank you, Andy, that was great. So we did have um, a few questions come in. Um, I'll start with the first one that was, we are using microservices. How can we implement authorization and authentication into those? Author, so that's a great question. Um, it depends on which microservices that you want. Uh, and like, let's say if I'm using the container environments um, like Kubernetes, um, if you were using uh, like serverless environments, um, it depends on like which kind of environments that you want to use. But um, Vault, for example, handles uh, elegantly all of those. The different authentication methods that are available for Vault, there are dozens, if not hundreds, if you want to count the community uh, supported ones um, that exist uh, for pretty much all of them. And what that means is that when you authenticate in through that, that authentication channel into Vault, Vault can attribute that authentication workflow and then align it to whatever you'd want to like create before as like a, a workflow for access control rights and RBAC. So let's say that I want to go start using, for example, Kubernetes, right? I want to be able to start having a new workflow for when I deploy services uh, or applications from within a specific pod that they can gain the right credentials or the means to authenticate access and do things. Um, I have, there's an auth method in Vault that allows me specifically to do that. Then I can have it, uh, you know, orchestration involved with a certain secret engine to be able to drop in like dynamic credentials into that pod. The pod has no idea what's going on. It just says, oh, look, this is credential. Now I can go do whatever I want. And the reality is that credential is going to die in 10 seconds. So uh, if an adversary goes and steals it, it's not a big deal. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, you know, there's a, a ton of different ways to do that from the vault side. Um, and within boundary and console, console's real role there would be more in the networking angle of like, how would, uh, how would that application or that microservice like to like uh, communicate or otherwise um, resource that credential or other mechanism with vaults or another service. Um, that being said, I mean, sometimes the service meshes for those applications like Kubernetes also have their own different types of service mesh. Um, it's really, this kind of really well highlights sort of here at HashiCorp, we don't require you to use all of our products with, you know, specifically within the Hashi, uh, the Hashi Eco like system. You can pick and choose which ones make the most amount of sense for you. Perfect. Thanks. The next question that came in was, can identity verification use MFA for user identification? Absolutely. Um, so, um, yeah, so for Vault, uh, you know, we have a number of different ways to attribute um, multi-factor authentication. Uh, you could do it within Vault, like I could trigger MFA transactions within Vault. I could also have Vault, for example, resource your existing MFA system, if you're using an SSO system um, that has MFA that you've already encoded. I can go, yeah, you know, authenticate via OADC and say, hey, by the way, go, can you go through and use your existing MFA workflow? We can do that. There's a number of different ways to attribute it, but absolutely, that's an elemental part of the security within Vault. Perfect. Next question was, how does Vault compare to AWS Secrets Manager? Oh, good question. So it's really interesting because I come from a world of like security where everyone is like at each other's throat and the vendors are all like grappling with this. We don't really see things like that here at HashiCorp. Um, you know, Secrets Manager is a good product uh, and it's a, and because when we look at like sort of what Vault is trying to do, it's really more of a difference on opinion of philosophy. Um, Vault's philosophy is that identity is going to change. This is really an identity problem more than like protecting the secrets with good cryptography problem. I mean, yes, we both of us need to do that. But with Vault, we say, look, the real challenge that you're going to face, like, you know, using this workflow tomorrow, the next day, five years down the road, is not about did I protect secrets in a specific way within one cloud. It's that I don't necessarily know where my infrastructure is going. So I don't necessarily know where my identity is going. I need to be able to build a way that I can create one workflow that's not going to change, but that identity systems that I'm going to verify that workflow with are going to change. Secrets Manager does not take that approach because rightfully so, it's it's coded specifically within an AWS, right? There's one identity infrastructure that I'm going to statically define and use off of it. That's not bad because especially when you talk about like, think about the use case for Secrets Manager, it's typically like just for AWS allocations on this one specific workflow. But what it means is you're effectively locked into that identity model and Vault does not lock you into that identity model. And it's a little bit more of like a um, Swiss army knife uh, for different workflows. Like Secrets Manager is really good at protecting secrets, uh, but what Vault usually focuses on is, okay, 
I want that orchestration step also, right? Like I don't want necessarily want to like protect the secret. Can you just do the thing I was trying to do with the secret for me so that I don't have to worry about that as an application of like protecting the credential and to get it, right? Like I don't want you necessarily to give me the AWS secret key for my entire infrastructure. What I want you to do is like to handle the thing that I was trying to do with that AWS secret key. It's a bit of a different philosophy than Secrets Manager. And, um, you know, as a consequence, I think Vault has especially more usage multi-cloud um, as well as across like different types of utilities. Like I can have Vault be a CA, I can have Vault manage key lifecycle management for me, et cetera, just different philosophy. Great, okay, so next question. Do you have any idea when there will be a boundary integration with Vault and OICD, um, Okta? Stay Doesn't tuned. Seem to, okay. <laughs> Short answer is yes. This is a big we we. This is a big area of boundary that we're very excited about. Uh, very much. Stay tuned. Awesome. Okay. So, what is the best method of deployment of boundary? Is it access via VPN? Then the network is behind that, or is boundary internet facing? Boundary can be internet facing. Um, I think that, you know, to step back, and I know there's another question that was about this, you know, Boundary right now is a, we don't support like Boundary Enterprise right now as a company. Um, it's really in the early stages of its release right now. But in many ways, from an architecture point of view, Boundary actually replaces what would be considered a VPN, right? Like rather than, you know, hand holding credentials that I would need to use to that VPN and then kind of hoping for the best, Boundary takes care of a lot of the like secondary authorization and authentication to the target system that I chose to connect to, and then instantiating secure communication throughout that entire process. So in many ways, that replaces a lot of the conventions of a VPN. Um, so it enables more of like direct access, like internet facing access. But you know, I, I think that as you start to see the evolution of boundary and eventually the what commercial offerings will build on top of boundary, um, those will well highlight the fact that there will be different reference architectures for how you should deploy it. Great, right. and I think this next question was kind of similar, but uh, they really like the concept of Boundary. They know it's a young product. Do you know if Boundary is standing up to any compliance audits, for instance, using Boundary as Bastion or HTTPS presentation to limit PCI scope? Is the Boundary desktop app a means to get traditional users using Boundary? It seems the CLI and UI are more dev or DevOps focused workflows. Yeah, really good questions. I mean, so again, boundaries in the early stages of its like life as a product. That being said, you're kind of touching on the reasons why we built boundary. Yes, we would like the desktop client to be a means um, to uh, allow users to, um, you know, that are not necessarily DevOps users that are not developers or technical to be able to access uh, securely these target systems um, without having to like manage their own, like a, a big key ring of their own to be able to authenticate in. Um, that's really important to us. That's one of the reasons why we built it. That's one of the reasons why, for example, even in this early life cycle, there are desktop clients available for Boundary today. Um, in terms of audits and everything else, I mean, we built Boundary for these reasons, but again, we don't support a commercial offering for Boundary today. So um, while there are, you know, some of our users uh, within Vault and Console that are using Boundary today, they're not using it in a way that like they've, you know, subjected it to some of the rigors of audit that we, we are very used to in Vault. Right, like with Vault, you know, Vault regularly stands up to different types of audits. Um, you know, we audit Vault ourselves with, uh, you know, semi-annually with external auditors, um, as well as conduct like audits with Vault and are currently undergoing audits with Vault for things like FIPS. Um, these are things that Boundary will go to. Like this is with, as once we get a, a commercial offering out, this will be something that we will focus on. But today, it's really more about laying the foundations. We're just laying strong foundations for Boundary right now. Perfect. I think um, that kind of answers the next, que next question, which was, is boundary production ready? Any companies using it as privileged access management solution? If not, do you have a timeline? <laughs> the most dangerous thing a product manager can ever tell you is, <laughs> is this um, time. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, we do sh short, like, I, I would say that you will see here more information about this over the course of the next year. Um, I can't go into more detail than that, but yes, the privilege, I think you're rightfully bringing up that privileged access management is the area where Boundary is going to be participating in, in concert, likely with Vault, but also on its own, right? Again, we don't have to have Boundary, like Boundary doesn't need Vault necessarily, it just works better together. Um, so the evolution of Boundary will be very exciting. I, I'm, I personally am very excited for us to show off where we're thinking about how we have commercial offerings with Boundary because it will really address some of these elements of privilege access management likely, but We'll see how things evolve. 
Awesome. Um, the next question, someone said, over the years, I think Beck's best practices have relaxed a bit. For example, a while ago, it was suggested to install Vault on physical machines. As today, almost everything goes, for example, deploying Kubernetes, where other potential dangerous workloads are running. Are companies lowering the bar in favor of ease of operations? That's a fantastic question um, because I don't think this is, they're lowering the bar necessarily. What I think is changing is how we look at infrastructure. So Vault was originally proposed to be run on isolated systems. And we still encourage that because of sort of runtime security concerns. What's changed a lot within Kubernetes, for example, is how Kubernetes and pods handle different ways of authentication and protecting data at the runtime with them. So it's been less of like, hey, I'm concerned about you running Vault and Kubernetes because, um, you know, something with Vault necessarily and more, okay, you know, when I deploy Vault with a Helm chart, I can uh, better harden that and isolate the sort of the operations of that within Kubernetes better today than I could like a few years ago. So it's not necessarily that they're relaxing uh, conventions, it's that the infrastructure behind application or systems like Kubernetes are changing a lot. Um, and are getting better. I think also, you know, that's not for nothing to say that like there aren't ways that we can improve this in Vault too. We've been readily improving Vault over the last like five years uh, to really get better at you know hardening for system security. I think we still haven't gotten to the point where we would like to include the host fully in our security model because there's some things that we want to do first. But this is sort of where we see the next frontier at in Vault. Like a big part of our focus on the Vault roadmap is on okay. Let's, we haven't talked about the host in a while. We haven't talked about how we protect Vault's host for a bit. We've always just said, like, here's some security guidelines, do these things, and, like, you know, really, like, the caveats, like, of where Vault's security model ends, be mindful of them. What if we extend that boundary a little more? You know, pun intended, I guess. But, like, what if we, like, start to think about, like, extending the security model better of Vault to now encompass the host? There's a lot of other things we need to do there. But certainly the demands to do that are not based off of a relaxed security model in the community. It's more of about runtime security and our conventions of what we think is good runtime security are starting to change, largely due to changes in Kubernetes and other types of microservices. Great, it looks like one more question came in. So if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we do have a few more minutes, but um, Vault as a PKI is good in dev environment, adding an OCSP and a better UI to manage the so manage and sort the keys issued and revoked would be very helpful. Are there any open source projects that can help achieve something like that? I don't know about open source projects, but we're working on that. <laughs> um, this yeah. is a, like a big area of uh, focus for us too, because you're right. Like I think uh, Vault as a CA, a certificate authority is a very popular use case of Vault, especially Vault Enterprise. So when we think about those three use cases of all, right, there's secrets management, encryption as a service, and privilege access management, like 70% of encryption as a service is this use case of Vault serving as a CA. So better management of that uh, from a UI perspective is something that we are actively working on right now. OCSP is a very interesting kind of question. Um, and I don't know the answer of like how we're going to tackle that. One challenge that's very unique to Vault is the fact that Vault's model of like how to be a good CA is a little bit different from a lot of other CAs, which is we should not let those certificates live for a long period of time, right? Going back to this whole model of like zero trust, what we really focus on is this model of like, I want you to like readily as an application, go, you know, re-verify you are who you say you are because the credential that you should hold on to, whether it's a key, a certificate, et cetera, should die. It should die very quickly. It should die frequently so that if an adversary steals it, they don't gain purchase of your infrastructure. So OCSP and how you kind of like interact with that really isn't against that model, but it's a very different kind of focus, at least historically with other types of certificate authorities than what we want to do with Vault. So if we do tackle that, we have to do so in a very thoughtful way and that's something that we're thinking through right now. Awesome. I think the follow up to that was when will OCSP be available? Will it work as an intermediate CA? <laughs> Stay tuned. But I mean, if we do take it down that path, it will be likely that we allow also intermediate CA kind of operations with it. I mean, like, you know, Vault today can be your root CA. It also frequently is deployed not as that at first. It is usually deployed as a root, like an intermediate CA on its own first, and then you kind of move to that model if you'd like to. So uh, if we do it, very likely that we will go down that path as well. Um, but again, it's a little bit different to think about OCSP with how we look at PKI right now, just because it's it historically is a different philosophy. So we have to, I think, be very thoughtful about if and when we go down that path. 
Awesome. Uh, last question was, will tokenization in Ball always be just an enterprise feature? Oh, good question. Uh, you know, I, I think it will be never say never, but I think, you know, when we look at what tokenization and really the transform secret engine as a whole is trying to solve, um, you know, it's a different style of sort of operation than something that kind of looks like transform, which is the trans secret engine, which is an open source. And let me step back to like the difference in philosophy. Transform, whether I'm tokenizing data or using FPE to um, protect that data with format preserving encryption, is really about the white glove process of protecting data in a way that's going to live outside of Vault with Vault's rigorous level of security. Transit is really about Vault serving as a, a cryptographic foundation for you to do key lifecycle management at like a really kind of like core fundamental level. Um, it the but then the encryption itself you're typically handling on your own you're handling like that process on your own um that's a big difference right that's a big difference between a white glove process to be like go protect all the data in my database versus vault generate me a bunch of keys and then i could go encrypt them myself or do whatever i want with them so you know the open source kind of methodology that we we focus on is really more around that like i want to give you the tools to be able to kind of figure out what you want versus i'll take care of a lot of the stuff for you um and that's kind of usually the difference between sort of like their philosophy between the like kind of like the open source version of like the transform secret engine, which could be construed to be like the trans secret engine, um, versus like things like tokenization. So it, I'm not sure. I, I you know I don't have an answer on that right now to be honest with you. But philosophically, they're very different in sort of how users use them. And as a consequence of that, um, you know most of the time it's it's our commercial partners that are more concerned with using tokenization usually you know around um compliance requirements that like teams or otherwise like individual users that are using vault are not subject to personally awesome that looks like the last question that came in so thank you to everyone who joined us today big shout out to andy for taking the time to present and answer all the questions if you do have any additional questions that you think of um feel free to send me an email you have my email from the reminder email and everything, and I can route you to the person to get that answered. Um, additionally, this was recorded um, and will be made available after post-processing, which usually takes a few days. Um, and I will email it out to everyone that um, everyone that joined the event today. Um, so thanks again to everyone. Thanks, Thank Andy. You.